Good to go. How's it sound? Sounds good. That's looks good. Sounds good from this end? Yeah, that looks that's okay. great. Okay. All right, everybody, we are back. Is it recording? It's recording. We are live. All right. This will be podcast number 11. It's a little odd having the cameras over there. I'm unaccustomed to this. <laughs> yeah. uh, historically, it's just been me with a mini recorder sitting between the other person. Um, so I'm going to have to work. Adjusting the fly. To not look over there. You may not like my profile anyway. We look like before and after <laughs> D90X. You, you look good. <laughs> <laughs> you look good. Yes. P90X. P90X. I haven't heard that one in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first one I could think I, of. Yeah, yeah. Old, old Tony Horton. Man. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, so this is podcast number 11, Neil Woodall. Woodall? Woodall. 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 Thank you for doing this. Yeah, uh, I know that Denise uh, somehow managed to get a shout out to Denise Marshers every time she was happy you were going to be on here. Yeah. So uh, the McCoy House Mixer has now grown to this deluxe piece of equipment you see in front of you. Uh, again, so my name is Drew Hassan. This is Danny Anderson, the new co-host, audio engineer, uh, energy injector. <laughs> <clears throat> Certainly glad to have your help. Absolutely. Everybody should give Danny a round of applause for all his help. He certainly uh, helped with all the technological advancements. I'm apparently on TikTok now. Uh, I guess Charlie D'Amelio is going to. Yeah, you better watch she's out. She's going to be watching our videos. Absolutely. I will not be dancing. Under any <laughs> I, think, I think it's my first time on TikTok, to be honest with you. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. He does. I mean, it's a colossal waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but you know what? It could reach that one person that is struggling that needs to hear something. It could reach that one person, and it could change their life. Well, so. it's certainly going to reach the Chinese government. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so I've got my general introductory statement here. <clears throat> so look, people, uh, listeners, y'all are not doing a very good job with comments. We need to enhance our comment section. I was looking at some of our metrics, and we're reaching far more people than I thought. Uh, especially, especially with the Facebook Live, and now that we're on TikTok, that will be even more. So we would like more involvement. Yes, I'm talking to you. You should feel the need to comment, whoever you are. So again, nominate people to be on the podcast. Give me some topics for recovery, steps you want to talk about, psychology of recovery, anything. Uh, the more people that we have interacting, the more successful it will be. Uh, we have had an impressive outlay of capital to get some of this new equipment, so we really could benefit from your financial support. We're not wasting it. There ain't no party. Uh, we're not going to the club or anything. It all goes to benefit the podcast. So for now, we're still using my cash tag accounts, cash tag Daniel Hassan. Anything would help, we certainly appreciate it. And I thank you in advance for your donations. All right, Neil. So without further ado, nobody tunes in to hear me drone on. What about it, man? How are you? Doing well, man. Doing well. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah. You know, when Danny reached out, I was kind of, uh, well, first of all, I was intrigued because, you know, this is uh, this world of recovery, modern day recovery has shifted so much. Obviously, the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, we've got that, uh, that 12th tradition that states the anonymity spiritual foundation of all our traditions. And, uh, but to me, to what Danny stated earlier, just about TikTok and just where we are and how people digest content nowadays, like this to me is such a huge avenue to reach other people. Well, look, Matthew Perry, you know, from Friends yep. was on the Good Morning America the other day, and he mentioned the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he's... He relayed something that was intended to be a quote. It wasn't anything that leapt out at me that I remember, but I was was a little bit taken aback that he had done that. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm okay with it. Yeah. It's important that the message gets out and uh, that people know that there is a way out of this. You know, I didn't know anything about recovery before I came in here. So the fact that, and we certainly didn't have TikTok and Facebook when I first came in here. So it's important that... Um, you know, we take advantage of every avenue that we possibly can to reach as many people as we can because there we're planting seeds here. That's what we're doing here. We're planting seeds. So if somebody, if something is is heard or somebody hears something and a tree grows, 
years from now, it would be a success that we're doing this right now. So uh, we're, we're really appreciative of you coming on and, and uh, lending your, uh, your expertise on the, on the topic. Um, you know, you and I go back where, uh, you know, you were my sponsor for some time. And, um, and you know, I, I wasn't doing the deal. I just wasn't doing the deal. So, um, you know, nothing in, in God's world happens by accident. And I think it's just an absolutely wonderful thing that you were willing to come on and, uh, and, uh, and share your experience, strength, and hope with us. So. Yeah, absolutely, man. And like you said, uh, this day, this disease, man, it's hitting on so many different levels right now. I mean, obviously, um, it's expanded so much since the big book was written. And so many young people are now being impacted by this disease and dying. And so to your point, I mean, to me, the importance of getting this message out, it's pivotal at this time. Because more, I mean, COVID was a rough time. Um, these young folks that are getting into to drugs, I mean, obviously with the fentanyl stuff, all the things that are happening right now, people are dying at a very rapid rate right now. So whatever we can do to get the word out there, I'm all for it. So here, here. Well, look, tell us a little bit about your own personal Recovery story. Yeah. Um, so my sobriety date is July 19, 2014. Um, my, so as far as um, drugs of choice, opiates was a big, um, big factor in my choice to get into recovery, but alcohol was always there. And I think that's kind of a recurring theme in a lot of our stories. Alcohol had kind of always been in the background. Um, I know you'd, you'd ask me to send you some, some questions, or you send me some questions and some things. Right just, here. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, without getting into too much of the details of, of these, the different elements that brought me into the recovery community, um, long story short, um, I grew up as an athlete, a big part of my identity growing up was being an athlete. Um, I mean, from the time that I was four or five years old, I was out in the football field, basketball court, um, soccer field, baseball field. My dad was my coach, um, majority of my life. He was also a hero and a mentor to me. And, um, when I, by the time I got so drinking was always kind of there you know it's one of those things in high school it started probably my sophomore year um it was usually people drinking after football games baseball games that type of thing and uh you know, i wasn't i wasn't immune to that but i always identified myself as an athlete so i didn't go hard in the paint until probably college time that's when i kind of started to experience the the disease of alcoholism and at that time i really didn't fully understand that that's what it was that i was dealing with i really thought that it was depression anxiety other things that were kind of hitting me hard and um, never chalked it up to, to the fact that those were just the isms of alcoholism. I mean, and I've struggled with, um, with overeating. I've struggled with undereating. I've struggled with drinking. I've struggled with obviously the opiates. I've struggled with um, amphetamines. I mean, you name it, I've, I've tried them all. And I was always just trying to fill that hole in my soul with something and feel better about myself. And, you know, there was different phases in my life where something would work, you know, uh, whether it was eating or exercise or drinking, I feel that sense of relief and I'd be like, okay, this is the answer. This is the thing that I've been looking for. This is the thing that makes me feel okay with who I am. And uh, that would work for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, that thing that became my best friend, the thing that I was leaning so dependently on, turned uh, on me, turned on me, became my worst enemy. And all of a sudden, the thing that looks, that, that initially was smiling back at you, that had that friendly smile, all of a sudden becomes the devil that's looking back at you. And um, it wasn't until... I mean, I, I struggled with that through, through college days, but really, um, part of my story is, uh, my freshman year of, of college. Um, it was, we just finished up my first semester and I was playing football at the time, just finished up my first season of football, freshman football season. And we used to go on an annual hunting trip with my dad, one of my dad's big business customers. And we went to a little town, Loosedale, Mississippi. I'm sure some of the folks are familiar with Loosedale. I went to a faith-based treatment center in Loosedale. Did you? Now I didn't yeah. even know there was anything well, else outside it's of Loosedale. Huge. Yeah, is it's it enormous. Building? It's okay. a huge building. They got like 150 people there. Oh wow, that's that's bigger than the hospital they took me to, to after my hunting accident. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was um, I was involved in a hunting accident. My my dad, we were, we, we'd go there annually. We've been doing it for over a decade at this point. And uh, we go, we go duck hunting the first day. And then the second day we'd all go quail hunting. And the second day we went out there. New, usually there's probably five to 10 people that go. And this one particular day, there's only three of us. That's my dad, myself, and another guy. And so we went on the field. I'd shot my limit for the dead. My, um, the other guy that was with us had shot his limit. My dad was one bird off from hitting his limit for the dead. And so I said, hey, look, you know, go up there with, uh, go up there with the guy 
uh, there's one bird that kind of flown rogue, and I remembered exactly where it landed. And I said, I guarantee that bird's sitting in that same area. Sure enough, dog gets on point. You know, and when you're quail hunting or bird hunting, I'm sure there's some folks on here. Obviously, everybody's aware of where the person is that's standing beside them, the people that you're hunting with. Well, in this particular situation, my dad was about 25 yards ahead of me. I was 25 yards directly behind him. The other gentleman that was with us was probably about 40 yards off to my left. Well, I see the, the uh, dog on point. I see the guy look at my dad and say, are you ready? My dad starts, says, yep. Yeah. So the guy starts kicking around. Bird flies up. My dad immediately draws his gun. He's starting to wait for the bird to get far enough away so he doesn't blow the smithereens. By the time the bird gets far enough away, my dad's swinging around. The momentum from him swinging around, he doesn't see me directly behind him. Right out of, right out of his peripheral, he pulls the trigger, and the shotgun blast hits me directly in the chest and the face. Um, it was, you know, we talk about, like, Spider-Man senses your adrenaline through the roof. I remember just sitting there and just being like, okay, first off, what just happened? My immediately thought was that I got struck by lightning because I tested, tasted metal in my mouth. I saw a flash of bright light. Next thing that I remember is the other guy that's with us yelling for me to sit down. And I'm sitting down. He gets over to me. He's taking his shirt off. I mean, it's the middle of January. Takes his shirt off, stuffs it down in mine to keep me from bleeding out. But the thing that I remember the most was my dad. And my dad starts um, screaming, oh, my God, I just shot my son. And he eventually makes his way over there. He takes his shirt off, sticks his shirt down in mine. The guy at this point has grabbed the dog. He's running back with the dog. It's going to be at least a 45-minute trip for him to get to the truck. So we're sitting out there, and it's the three of us. And um, the guy that's with us, the other gentleman that's with us, he's a, he was actually a competitor of my dad's as far as in the sales world. The guy looks at us and says, hey, do you mind if I pray with you all? And at that time, I was not a man of faith. You know, I, went, I was brought up Catholic, but I wasn't somebody that was really strong my faith. And at that time, I'm sitting there like, you know, if there really is a God, would he have come down at this point and like, protected me from this happening? You know, I don't expect him, if we say a prayer right now, for him to roll a golden staircase down from heaven and walk down from heaven and heal me of my wounds. But um, I agreed at that time. And I remember, I, I mean, I grabbed them both and I said, hey, look, we're all men here. But at that time, I was 19, 20 years old. I said, look, we're all men here. I want y'all to shoot me straight, be honest with me. I'm not going to make it through this. And I know, I mean, it's birdshot, but at the time, I, mean, I didn't know how serious it was. The guy that's with us, like, yeah, you're going to be fine. My dad, he, he couldn't even look at me. And um, by the time the guy back, got back out there, it had been about 45 minutes for him to get the truck back out there. They load me in the truck. It's a single cab. So the guy's driving. They put me in the middle seat. My dad's in the driver's or in the passenger seat. The other gentleman that's with us, like, I'm just going to walk back to camp. So we start driving through the field, and at this point, my adrenaline's come down, and I just feel absolutely everything. I mean, the pain, pain is just excruciating. And I can, and then not only that, I can smell, like, the, it's the smell of burning skin. Like, if you ever burned yourself Burn on a candle, yeah, it, it, and it's, it's, it's disgusting. From the muzzle. <laughs> yeah, and so I remember, you know, and I'm just like, oh, my God, this is just excruciating. And I remember looking in the rearview mirror, and my eye was completely shut closed. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, there's no way I have an eye. There's no way that I have an eye through this. Look, I'm sitting across from you, and so I know that you don't have any glass eye or anything. Yeah. And like I'm sitting over, I can feel my hands sweating <laughs> in the story. Okay, you're in the field. Mm -hmm. you're dry. I mean, I've been bird hunting. Yeah. You know, you're out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they finally they get me in the truck, and like I said, the hospital they bring me to, they immediately get me to the hospital. Hospitals, I mean, the size of, you know, probably 10 of these rooms put together. They put me in the gurney, cut all my clothes off, immediately hooked me up to an IV for fluids because I lost a lot of blood at that point. And then they hooked me up to an IV for, for morphine. And I remember, you know, as soon as you get that clicker, start hitting the clicker. Feel that morphine going to my veins. I'm not going to say, like, boom, instant addict. <laughs> but what I can say is I remember that feeling of just, like, that warmth going up my arm, going across my chest, down my legs, and just feeling numb. And it was just... The physical pain had subsided, but it was really like that mental, emotional anguish that I was feeling. Did you ever taken a painkiller before then? I probably had. I'm sure that I had because I played football. You know, I had different injuries. Um, you know, broken bones and things like that, sprained ankles. Um, and I, I'd, I'd probably taken like hydrocodone, but it wasn't to the extent of that. And I don't remember it being like something. I, I probably enjoyed the feeling of it, but it wasn't something like. That that one's one of those ones that was just ingrained in my brain, obviously. I have wondered, so I, I don't want to inject too much, no, here, but this is really on point for me. Uh, Danny mentioned Daniel, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, when he was on the podcast last week about uh, 
you know, the opposite of recovery is connection. And we started talking about this guy named Johan Hari, who's written a book called Chasing the Screen. And he, he's got a TED Talk, and he's on Joe Rogan's mm-hmm. podcast, and it's real cool. And he talks about how, you know, how we contem- what we think of addiction really needs to be revamped. And he, ta- he offers up as some evidence for this that there are plenty of people that end up with a physical injury and they go or they have a surgery, they go to the hospital, they get morphine, they get delauded, they get oxycontin, whatever it is, and then they come out, they taper off, and life is fine. And I have wondered if you increase the likely like whatever box was checked in your brain mm-hmm. when you got that morphine, I wonder if it would have been if the trauma, mm-hmm. the fear that you must have felt about legit dying, if that made you more susceptible at that moment to addiction. No. Because it does happen, you know, where you, you're in a position where you you know you don't feel safe, mm-hmm. your whole world is crumbling down around you. In some sense there's a betrayal by the person that absolutely would never mm-hmm. betray you, yeah. never hurt you. And it's just interesting to me. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Because I think that there's so many points where this thing intersects and you bring in the, the factors of genetic predisposition to alcoholism or addiction. I mean, you got to factor that element in. But I think that, and I think um, there's another doctor, I can't think of his name, but he's he's very big on the tra- the trauma aspect of it. and says that trauma is a big, big factor in why people turn into a, turn to addiction. And, you know, when you think trauma, most people think like emotional trauma, maybe physical trauma where they were, you know, molested as a child. But trauma comes in a lot of different forms, I feel like. Absolutely. You, you know, all shapes and colors yes, and sizes. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that it's unique to each individual person. You know, what's traumatic to me may not be traumatic to you. Exactly. And, and it's all about how I perceive things. And so, yeah, I mean, to what you're saying, I would, I would imagine that that had some kind of impact on it. Um, and again, I, I mean... My grandfather, my biological grandfather, my dad's dad was was an alcoholic and addict, and he left my dad and his two younger brothers. My dad was probably about ten years old, so it was in my family, and I have other family members that have it. But um, I think so, it's a perfect storm, to be honest with perfect you. Perfect storm. Yeah. So you're laying there, mm-hmm. you get the morphine. Yeah, I get the morphine, and um, I remember just that that feeling of being like, this this feels good. And again, it wasn't like instant addict in that moment, but I remember feeling like. I could, I could dig this. I, could, I dig this. This is something I could probably see myself doing again. And obviously, I was in the hospital there for a couple of days, and then they transported me to to the local hospital where I was, where I lived in Covington, Louisiana. And I was there in ICU for a few days, and then they put me in the regular uh, regular hospital room. But when they sent me home, I mean, there really wasn't much they could do because it was, I mean, it was birdshot. They said the fact that the gun was across my chest that protected a lot of my major major organs. Um, the fact that I was bigger at that time, I was playing football. I have 235 pounds at the time. So I was, I was pretty big. And um, so a lot of the pellets were really just kind of the muscle. And Are they them. still in there? Yeah, I still got them. You can <laughs> oh, see them. Let's see. You can see this one here. You can see them in my hands right there. Jeez Louise. Like this one, this knuckle's really big. I've got them in my head. If I get an x-ray, you can see just a bunch of white dots. Looks like a bunch of polka dots. On my you chest. need one of those things on your seatbelt that mm-hmm. says... Uh, no MRI. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. If you get an MRI machine, you're it, pull, it, it pulls everything out. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Exactly. So I'd be, I'd be in a, in a bad, bad spot. You'd be, yeah. You'd, you'd be in a really bad out. spot. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we obviously I, I communicate that when I go to the hospital. Yeah. I know that. But um, but yeah. So it, it was um. I mean, Who knew we had Iron Man living right now? <laughs> How about that? It doesn't feel like I'm Iron Man. It's it yeah, more, 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 more lead man is what it is. And actually, that was what we were trying to figure out. Is we had a bunch of different lead shells. Lead poisoning. It's, yeah, so we had a bunch of shells, and we were trying to figure out what it was. And lead was a concern at the time. But they said if it didn't get any major arteries or anything like that, you'd be fine. And so the way that I found out, interestingly enough, because they didn't really know, is I remember I had one that was kind of on the surface of my skin, and I, was, I remember I was sitting there and I was back in class at this time because so all of a sudden I had to go back to school, get back into class and I had a few that were working their way out and I popped one out and I took it on a piece of paper and I remember there was a guy sitting next to me and he's watching me take like a pen <laughs> and I'm taking this this piece of lead out of my arm and he's like looking like, what the hell is this going on? <laughs> and then I take it to a piece of paper and I start scribbling and sure enough, I mean, it was lead. Wow. But, uh, but yes, they said the fact that it didn't get any major orders that it'd be okay. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I'm not going to say dodge the bullet quite so. <laughs> no, I did not dodge the bullet. I took it, I took it directly to the chest and face. <laughs> wow. Damn. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, you you take with you from this experience some potentially problematic lead yeah. and an itch for opiates. When do you, and, and, and a bunch of prescriptions and for a opiates. A <laughs> bunch of pain medication because, like I said, there wasn't much they could do. So essentially what they say is, you know, um, we're just going to send you home. It's just about managing the pain now. So. It was a kind of like, I can do that. Yeah, yeah I can yeah, manage this. Yeah, yeah, I can manage this myself. Was, was it like open wound? Like, was it like... Yeah, I wish I had a picture. I mean, I could actually probably send it to y'all. But, um, yeah. yeah, there's a picture where you see me. And, I mean, I'm just all puffed up because, I mean, just the... Right. But, um, the trauma. The yeah, trauma. yeah. Yeah, and so it's a bunch of just, I mean, just bloody spots all over my chest. It looks, right. like, it looks like a bloody, bloody, um, um, like just polka dots across my chest, really. Yeah, yeah so... Crazy. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, so they send me home with that and I start taking... You know, taking the pain medication, taking the muscle relaxers. Because I had one that was lodged, like, actually, I had some that got in my lungs. So my lungs, that was something I had to do breathing treatment on. And there'd be times where, like, my diaphragm would, basically, it was like getting, like, a, a charley horse in your diaphragm, and I couldn't breathe. And so they gave me muscle relaxers to help to... to yeah, they did. Yeah, muscle, relax the muscles around. And so I was taking those in combination with each other. But initially, I mean, I was taking them the right way, but then I got to college, got back to school. And I'm sitting there like, well, I'm 235 pounds. You know, this is for a 165 pound person. I can take double up. You know, one every four to six hours. Shoot, I could take two every four to six sure, hours. Sure, why not? Then it's then it's four every couple of hours. You know, and then I'm just, but it's up until the point where I eventually run out of them. And at that time, you know, you crazy always do. Yeah, always you run, run, out. run out of them. But <laughs> I can remember like the thing that I remember the most about it was, I remember. First off, like my big focus when I got back to school was like, okay, I got to buckle down, get back to college, get, you know, get my grades back in order. And one of my biggest focus was like getting back to the football field. And actually I was, I was going to Millsaps to play football and baseball. But, um, at that point I ruled out baseball. I was like, by this time I have to go through the recovery process. Spring training was coming up. I was like, there's no way I'm going to get out there for spring training. So I was like, you know what? I'm just not going to play baseball this year. I'm just not going to play baseball period. So my focus was getting back into the weight room starting to train again, get myself healthy so I could get back on the football field. And so to me, opiates was attractive because, I mean, obviously I'm a college kid and I'm drinking and we're going to parties and you're familiar with Millsaps. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the college kid. What was your major? I was a business major. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what were you? You were political science. Political science, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was business. But God, at, that, at, at that time, I didn't know what I wanted to be, to be honest with you. <laughs> God, uh, God bless Dr. Iron Omabari. Yes. He was my man. He is, yes. He yes. just died not too long ago. I heard that. I was pretty bummed out. Yeah, God bless that man. That's a good man right there, for sure. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I remember the thing that was attractive to me about the opiates was the fact that I could take some pain pills and then go out to the attorney houses and get a few beers in me and not be super hungover the next day. And I could wake up and go to workouts and do things like that. But also, the big thing I remember is like, when I took opiates and I drank a couple of beers on it, I felt like that confidence, calm, cool, and collected. Felt like I was a smooth operator, could talk to the girls, felt like I could dance a little bit better. Just felt like just Joe Cool when I was out there. But um, yeah, eventually those ran out. And uh, you know, it's funny because at that time, opiates weren't like a regularly, it wasn't around very big. What year was this? 05. It was 05, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, they were there, but they weren't, it wasn't like a, a popular thing at that time. But it wasn't until later on, probably 07, when they started to kind of come around. Started seeing the Oxycontin coming around. And um, at that time, it was like the, the Oxy 15s and Oxy 30s. And so that, that started to come around and started experimenting with those things. But really, um, it wasn't until I got out of college that it kind of hit me hard. And that's when I really delved into it deep. I have had a ongoing quest with myself to try to finesse what is the best amount of to be closer yes best amount of how we land with an addiction mm -hmm. so because i really want people to focus on the good part mm -hmm. like but also feel the need to have people talk about what their drug of choice was so that other people can say hey look i mm -hmm. i don't know many people that are going to say my daddy shot me no. but mm -hmm. uh you know they can certainly uh, relate to an opiate addiction so how to get bad for you? Yeah. What, what was the turning point? So for me, um, you know, I knew how much I enjoyed them and I knew that I enjoyed the feeling they gave me, but it wasn't until I got out of college. So I was out of college and at that time I was, I just remember being so, I was scared to death because, you know, football is about to be taken away from me. School is about to be taken away from Part me. Part of your identity. Yeah, my identity. And like, I really had no idea who I was or who I wanted to be. 
didn't know who I wanted to be when I grew up. Grew up. So I remember leaving college and I actually had a really cool experience where um, I was going to get my master's. And so they had offered a program, Millsaps offered a program at the time where you could go overseas for 12 weeks, uh, six weeks, excuse me, go over there, go to London, Brussels, Belgium, go to Munich, Germany, but basically experience Europe, but get some course credits for sure. it. And so I went over there and it was, because uh, when I finished up school, I was kind of hitting like a depression. Like I really don't know what I want to do. And I went over there and that was a really cool experience. And I came back and kind of had a game plan. Um, uh, you know, and one, one of my favorite quotes comes from uh, an unlikely source, comes from Mike Tyson. He says, everybody's got a game plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I had a game plan. I remember coming back on the flight and being like, I got this thing figured out. And when I was over there, I remember drinking heavily, especially in Munich, Germany, because it was like, you know, they had that hot beer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was, I mean, everywhere you went, they had all the, um, the beer gardens and all of that. And so I remember coming back. And I was like, all right, I'm going to buckle down. This is my time to like really focus on what my next steps are, what my career path is going to be, what my job is going to be. So I came back. I was like, I'm going to get this job. I'm going to go into sports performance. That's really what I wanted to do. Get my master's. And so came back and I, and I jumped head first into it. And things were starting to kind of line up for me. Started dating a girl. Started thinking things were going to be, you know, life was going swimmingly for me at that time. You've got a lucky Stein. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Got all those things. Yeah, yeah. Br- brought it back with me. I'm surprised I didn't bring any tattoos back with me. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so I've got this game plan. And, um, you know, I, I remember doing the coaching thing. I was coaching pretty, my coaching career kind of not flourished because you don't make a lot of money in coaching, but at the time I was doing my coaching career kind of not flourished. Sorry. Sorry, my bad. Go ahead. You're good. So at the time I was doing um, boot camps. I was coaching boot camps, early morning boot camps. And then I was coaching athletes, um, professional athletes, high school athletes, college athletes. And my day was kind of sporadic. I'd wake up in the morning at 3 a.m., coach groups until about 8 o'clock, have a break, train some groups around noontime, Get another break, train some groups, three, four o'clock in the afternoon, all up until six. And yeah, you're class. on that reverse school schedule. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so it was, it, and it was, it, I mean, I was, I was full days packed, you know, and there wasn't a lot of time to think about drinking or using or partying or anything like that. I was really focused on school and kind of getting my, my ducks in a row and met a girl and girl that I eventually knew I wanted to marry. And so I was like, you know what? Hey, I'm going to continue this coaching thing. But then I realized like, hey, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time away from her. My hours are crazy. I'm waking up at the butt crack of dawn. And I'm not making a lot of money doing this. I'm like, I want to buy eventually buy this buy this girl a ring and eventually have a family. So, started putting some feelers out there and had a buddy who reached out to me. His dad owned a, a chemical company, industrial chemical company, and uh, reached out to me. and said, Hey, man, would you be interested in doing industrial chemical sales? I said, I don't know the first thing about chemicals or sales, but I mean, yeah, hey, if it's if it's you know if the price is right, and at that <laughs> time I wouldn't get paid much of anything. Right. So, hey, whatever you got. So, they had a salary. They had all the you know allowances, car allowance, they had um, benefits, all the things that you need when you grow up, you want to be an adult. So I was like, hey, I'll, I'll jump on that. So I remember going out and I, I thought at the time, I was like, you know what, maybe I have a shot at this. My dad had been successful in sales. My biological grandfather, my mom's dad had been successful in sales. So maybe I got that kind of, that gene to be a salesperson. And so I went and did all the training and did all that kind of stuff. Went to New Orleans, the company's based in New Orleans and my territory is me in Mississippi. So I went there for a couple of weeks came back to Mississippi and I remember going to my first sales call and I was in Macomb, Mississippi and this guy walked into his office, he had a cowboy hat, he had one of those mustaches where he had all twisted up, cowboy boots on, big old belt buckle, invited me to his office, very kind gentleman, sat down, took his cowboy hat off, he said, all right, man, what you got? So I had a catalog and I, what I did is I slid the catalog across the table and I went through it and I, I did not stop talking for about an hour and a half, just going about everything that I knew. I don't think I even took a breath. I was like, yeah, this chemical, this chemical, this chemical, not asking him any questions. And I remember after the hour and a half, he closed it, he slid it back across, he said, man, I appreciate your time, but we're just not interested right now. <laughs> and I remember him looking at me like I was about this, about this big. Yeah. Or at least that's how I felt. That was a perception I had. Sure. He, he may have not thought anything of it. He may have just thought this, this guy doesn't know what the heck he's doing, but and I felt like, oh my God, he's I'm the judging worst me. Salesman. I, right. Right. I felt so small. Like I was like, oh my God, I'm so uncomfortable. My grandfather and father mm-hmm. are ashamed. They are ashamed. Right? Yeah, they're ashamed <laughs> of me right now. And so I, uh, I remember going to the car and sitting in the car, but yeah, you know, I had my box of chemicals, my samples, my catalogs, <laughs> my arms. I remember going back to my car, my head down. I got in the car, and I remember just thinking, I am terrible at this. This is like, and it was like the first time. Not to say I hadn't been bad at something in my life before, but. You know, like sports had come easy. School really kind of came easy to me. And it was like one of the times where I felt just like, I felt like a failure, just like an absolute failure. And then I was pathetic. And so I remember it was, I mean, it's just like, 
my first sponsor used to say, when an insane thought hits an insane brain, it comes out as a brilliant idea. And that's exactly what happened. I sat in the car, and I remember this thought came in, hey. That morphine will fix it. Yeah, hey, what yeah. if, uh, how about those painkillers, you know? Those give you confidence. Those make you feel okay with who you are. What if you tried taking one of those? And so I um, actually had a few left over from, I don't even know where, where I got them. It's probably from a fo- from former football injury. And so I went back, and I took a couple, and I went on my next sales call. Now, whether or not it did better, I don't know. But I, I what, what happened is I actually made a sale. You sold a bunch of shit. I sold, I, sold, I, sold, I sold a box. I sold a box of, like, aerosol cans of, like, wasp spray or something like hey. that. And... Um, but what it did is it was like a neuro association. Like, Absolutely. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Like, hey, I take pain pills. I feel okay. <laughs> I feel successful. confident. I make a sale. And so, like, boom, that, that chain reaction kind of went off. And so I started doing that and started leaning more into it. And, like, I was like, and I remember telling myself, I was like, you know, I'm going to do this until I feel okay with myself and get that confidence that I so desperately want. Until I get that confidence, I'm going to do this. But once I get there, I'm going to cut this all out. And I remember doing it. And, it was, I mean, I was making sales. I was making money. And eventually made, you know, made enough to, to buy a ring and started kind of seeing some success in that area and was using more and more pain pills. But I had some, some connections, some people that I knew that had pain pills, guys that I played football with from that had like former ACL tears and had to get surgery and things like that. And they, were, they just didn't even want them. They just give them to me. And so I was taking them and never really thought much like this was an issue. I just was like, hey, this is something I can use. This is a crutch for right now and eventually I'll get off it. But as you know, that beast just continues to grow. Yeah, you never think this, you know, the tiger's got me by the tail yeah. here. Right. Yeah, it, 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 that never crossed my mind. It was never like, it was like, if I wanted to stop, I could stop doing this. Sure. You know, I could absolutely stop doing this, but it just got worse. And then eventually, you know, I ran out of resources, my friends. Crossed the Rubicon. Yeah. 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 yeah, they didn't have any more of it. And so, all of a sudden, I reached out to some people I knew that smoked weed, and they were like, hey, I got a guy. Like, I don't sell pills, but I got a guy that does, and they gave me his number, and I remember texting this brand, this stranger, hey man, you know, got any in the Norco 10s and met the guy and he gave, I gave him money, gave me pills and boom, I got myself a drug dealer. Yeah. <laughs> and so I developed a very strong, deep relationship, quote unquote, with that drug dealer. They, by contrast, are phenomenal salesmen. <laughs> <laughs> they, have, they have eager and motivated clients. <laughs> right. They, they, they'll give you that first taste for free. Right. Because right, right, they know right. you're coming back. Look, right. that, there's no greater person on earth Mm-hmm. Than the first time you buy dope off a drug dealer. Amen. They're on time. That's right. They give you more than what you pay for. <laughs> They're your friend. And how quickly that oh, shifts. Right. How quickly that shifts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're sitting there in a parking lot waiting for hours saying, Where are you? But it's the worst. Yes, it's the worst. It is. Yeah, you sit there and you're like, Where are you this guy? I'm going to tell this guy this, that, and the other. And he shows up and you're like, Yes, sir. Give yes, me sir. a Mahal. <laughs> Thank you so much you're here. You know? I love you, God. I mean, yes. you're, my, you're my best friend. <laughs> you're going to stand in my wedding. You're my best man. I'm really proud of you. Yeah. So, stand up, fellow. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're a contributing member to society. Exactly. So, um, but yeah, that's that's when things started to, and eventually I did marry that girl, and um, in in the midst of like, and then all of a sudden things started getting chaotic, and my my drug use started just going through the roof, and started you know that money that I was making, um, I started spending more and more of it, and in the midst of all of this, I get a, a pharmaceutical sales job, um, a guy that I knew from back home, uh, he had a position open up in the Jackson area. So, and it was a really good, it was a good paying gig, and it was a really good gig because the top writing um, doctor for this particular uh, prescription was the person I'd be calling on. He's like, dude, it's, it's, a, it's a win-win for you. Well, it's, I've never met a poor yeah. pharmaceutical salesman. Yeah. They all live, live, live out well. home. Yeah. Well, so I jumped into that thinking that, you know what, this is my chance. It was like, okay, like, you know, I got another chance at this thing. Maybe I'll make enough money to, you know, outdo my spending right now and all the spending and then I'm going to stop this. I'm going to get, you know, eventually, you know, once I start this new career path, I'm going to stop it. And that was just another lie. And so I started spending even more money because I was bringing even more money in. And at the time, my wife um, just starts recognizing these huge chunks of money leaving the bank account. She's like, why'd you spend $400 here and $500 here? I mean, I just start lying. You know, like, hey, I've, you know, I had to pay this one bill and they wouldn't accept credit card anymore. You know, the the deadline was cut off. It was supposed to be paid at five o'clock yesterday. But are these expenditures for drugs, or are they just the money that I'm pulling out and spending? Yes, I'm spending these on drugs. Yeah. But what I'm telling her is that the money is going to is that I'm paying it for bills, and that I couldn't pay the bill online and or pay the credit you, card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, yeah, yeah. Of course, or chari- charitable donation or whatever it is. But I'm coming up with all kinds of things. You know, I got to take out a money order for this, 
And um, eventually, you know, and, and my, my thing at the time was I was waking up. Like she, she had a job. She'd go, she'd wake up and she had to be at the office at like, like 8 o'clock. And then the pharmaceutical sales world, you know, you have a little bit more lax schedule. I didn't have to be at the doctor's office until 10. I really set my own own schedule. And so what I would do is I'd sleep in. And if I didn't have anything that morning, obviously I'd be hurting. So I usually would just wait until I could get in touch with my dealer. And, and then once I could get in touch with them, I'd go meet them. And then I could go start my day. But what I would do is I would wait for the mailman to get there with the over, overdue bills, you know, all these different things. And I would intercept it so my wife couldn't see the bills coming in. And, um... So, but eventually, just like anything else, some of those started House slipping. House of cards. Yeah, man. yeah. Those things start slipping between the cracks and calls start coming in and she starts to, starts to do the math and says, you said you paid this bill with you know, this money that you pulled out, but clearly it's saying right here, we're four months overdue. We're about to get our water shut off or get our gas turned off or whatever, you know, insurance cut off. And then it started to be like foreclosure on our home because I stopped missing payments on our home. And that's when things started to get real bad and she started to realize, I mean, she just, I mean, I remember one time we had a conversation, she just flat out looked at me and she said, you're a drug addict. And I remember sitting there and I was just like, I can't, I can't say no that I'm not because clearly it's clear as day, you know, I absolutely am. And um, remember at that time she had pain medication for whatever. I mean, I took all her pain medication and told her I'd sold it to somebody else. But um, physically I'd lost like you know, 25 pounds. I wasn't, I wasn't staying in shape. I was always, physical fitness was always part of my life. Wasn't doing any of those things. Black circles under my eyes. Not getting out of bed until, you know, whenever I could get something in my system. And so she started to just be like, we started sleeping in separate rooms. And it became just a, an ugly relationship. And it, and it happened quickly. We'd only been married since, it was 2012 we got married. This is 2013, 2014 timeline. And things were already going off the rails pretty quickly. And, um, at that time, I was scared to death. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I had no game plan. <laughs> that game plan that I had, like I said, you know, I got punched in the mouth by addiction, and all of a sudden that went out the window. And so I remember I was sitting there, and um, I had a company car at the time. And what I did is we got in a big knockdown, drag out fight. And so at the, in the midst of all this chaos that is my life, I had two dogs, I had a male dog and a female dog. And of course, as an addict, I decided not to get either one of them fixed. And <laughs> The male got the female pregnant, so I had a litter of about six puppies. And I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with these six puppies. So I had four of them already adopted. I had two of them. One was going to be adopted by my dad. The other one was going to be adopted by a friend of mine. And so what I did is I was like, I'm going to take these two puppies. I'm going to load up my company car. I'm going to drive down to Louisiana, go to my mommy and daddy's house. As a 28-year-old man, go run to mommy and daddy's house, try to just hide and duck and cover for a little bit. But I really had no plan. But at the time, my buddy that was going to adopt the other dog, was a guy that was in, he was a guy that I knew was an alcoholic when I was at Millsaps. I mean, he was a guy that played in the football team, was an offensive lineman, guy that could drink anybody under the table. And so we knew back then that he was like headed for this, this road of destruction. And I caught wind of it like just a few, like six months prior, he had lost his wife. He'd been married, lost his good paying job in the oil field, lost his home. He had to move back from Houston to Louisiana to live with his parents at the time. And he was coming over to come get the dog. And so I was expecting this guy to be down and out, kind of loser, you know, expecting him to show up without a pot to piss in. And he shows up, gets out of the car. I mean, almost skipping up to the front door. He's got another girl, a girl with him, really pretty girl with him. And he's just in great spirits. And I can tell it's not like he's on drugs or anything like that. He's just like authentically happy and in a good mood. Has some bounce in his step. And I'm sitting there looking, I'm like, who is this guy? Like, why, what has he got going on in his life that's so great right now? And so I kind of pulled him to the side and I was like, hey, you know, what's, what's going on? I mean, I didn't ask him, hey, point blank, I know you, you just lost everything. Why are you in such good spirits? I thought you were a degenerate. Yeah, I thought that you were just like about to, you're on your, you know, suicide watch or something. But uh, <laughs> so I just started asking him, you know, I asked him, like, what's going on? He said, man, you know, I, I lost everything six months ago. He said, but what happened was I, I got into recovery. He said, I eventually started going to meetings. And I'm like, meetings? What do you mean meetings? He's like, yeah, AA meetings. Illuminati? What is and it? And I'm like, what, what are these meetings? But when he said AA, I'm like, what? Uh, not those people. You're not one of those people. It's like those people that sit around, drink styrofoam, a coffee out of styrofoam cups, pat each other on the back, say everything's going to be okay, sing kumbaya, and do all that. And I'm like, I just can't believe this is what this guy's doing. But, you know, Danny mentioned earlier about planting the seed. That's exactly what it did. I mean, it planted the seed in my mind. I remember he left and I remember went into my room of my parents' house and being like, just sitting on the bed and being like, what, what the hell are you going to do now, buddy? Like, what are you going to do about this thing? And I remember just like, 
you know what? I'm going to get honest. I'm going to go tell my parents what's going on. So I went and sat my parents down and I said, hey, look, I got something I got to tell y'all. And they're like, what? Let me guess, you're getting divorced. I was like, that's probably going to happen, but that's not really what I want to tell y'all about. And I was like, I've got um, something else I want to tell y'all. That I'm struggling with an addiction to, to opiates and, and I, drink, I drink alcoholically as well. And my mom just started crying, oh my God, and, you know, my poor baby. And my dad just looks at me dead in the eye and says, I can't believe you turned out to be one of those types of people. Ooh. And it was like, I mean, it was like a dagger in the heart, but it was a dagger in the heart, but at the same time, I understood where he was coming from because his dad, his biological father, who I've never met a day in my life, he had struggled with addiction and alcoholism and left my dad and his two young brothers. I, t- I told you all I mentioned a little while ago. He had left them and hit in my my grandmother to fend for themselves. He just up and left and went and lived his own life. They never heard anything from him. Every once in a while, he'd send a bizarre letter to my dad. But So my dad, and then his, my dad's youngest brother, my uncle, was in and out of treatment centers, in and out of jail. Um, had a lot of things happen to him. So my dad always viewed addiction and alcoholism as a weakness. It was just a... Moral failure. Yeah, moral failure. Exactly. That you were just... And he's sitting there looking at his son, who he knew he raised to be a man's man, a tough guy, a guy that was going to... You know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Stoic. Yeah, if you build, you know, if you will it, you see the way, you, you know, you go achieve it. And um, he's sitting there hearing his son say this to him. And he's sitting there saying, like, not only is he saying this to me, but he's saying it to himself. Like, I can't believe you turn out to be one of those types of people because I know I didn't raise you to be one of those types of people. And that was the thing is that, like, if you would have asked me, and I think probably if you ask any addict or alcoholic, you know, would you ever be an alcoholic or addict? When I was a kid, I would say, hell no, that's never going to happen to me. That would never happen. I live to under me. a bridge. Yeah, those those are those those sad, pathetic people, those homeless people that live under a bridge. I will never end up being one of those types of people. And here I was, and I was. That's exactly what I was. I was one of those types of people. So um, they said, you know, what are you going to do about it? I said, I don't know. This is good question. This is the first step. This good is question. this is really. I was like, I, I said, I don't, I don't have a plan. Like for the first time in my life right now, because up to that point, I always had something. Like I had some kind of idea of what I was like. All right, if I do this, this, and this, if I get my ducks in a row, it's all gonna work out. But at this moment, it was the only fucking mind. Be honest, and then from there, I had no idea what I was gonna do. And so they said, um, well. Have you considered treatment centers and things like that? And I was like, yeah, I've thought about it, you know, but I, really, I haven't done any research up at this point. So we started doing some research and I looked into some um, IOPs. And the initial plan was for me to go outpatient treatment. Because at the time I was like, you know, I still got a job, I still got a wife, I still got a home, I got all these things that I'm quote unquote managing so well, anyways. I'm not like, that bad. Yeah, I can't, I can't um, leave all those things to go take care of myself. I, gotta, I still got to be there for them. I wasn't there for them. I wasn't present. I wasn't doing any of those things. I wasn't taking care of anything. So I remember I went to my room that night and it was like this overwhelming feeling. It was, it wasn't a thought that came from me. I can assure you of that, but it was a feeling like you need to get your butt in the inpatient treatment center. And so I went and told my parents, I was like, Hey, look, you know, I, I just had this feeling. There's something in me that says I need to go inpatient. This is what I need to do. And they're like, sure. This is what you want to do. It's like, it's not what I want to do. It's what I have to do. And so we're like, all right, well, we'll start looking up some inpatient treatment centers and try to figure out what the game plan is going to be. And um, so I went to bed that night, and I get a text at about 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning from my boss at the time, our district manager, the guy that got me the job as a pharmaceutical sales rep. And he sends a message to group text to all of the people he manages and said that his son, who I grew up with a few years younger than me, had, had died in his sleep. And... Um, I knew his son. His son didn't die from natural causes. His son died of, a, of an overdose. And um, I remember hearing those words and just being like, wow, like, this is a, like, of course, it's being self-centered and selfish, you know, what does this mean to me? Right. And it meant to me at that time that that was God that was speaking to me and that I needed to get to an inpatient treatment center. And um, so I ended up going to an inpatient treatment center and, um, in Ethel, Louisiana at the time, a place called Woodlake. And I'm not even sure if it's still there, to be honest with you. I went to Woodlake. I was going there for 28 days. Um, but the thing was, before I left, this man just texted us. And I was trying to figure out a way that I was going to lie to my work and tell them, like, hey, I have to go. I told him I was going to go. What I was, my original plan is I was going to tell him I had to go visit my sister out in California for a month period of time to go help her with something. I couldn't really come up with a game, a, a good idea of it. But I was like, you know what? If I'm going to treatment, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to do the first, quote, unquote, courageous thing I've done in a long time. And I'm going to be honest. And so I called him. I was like, hey, look, I called, called my boss and I said, hey, I got something I got to tell you. 
but it's something I want to talk to you about in person. I don't want to do this over the phone. And so um, he's like, yeah, you can come by. He said, I've got some people over here right now that are, you know, obviously over here grieving his son's death. He said, but you're more than welcome over here and we can chat. And so I, I was going to drive over there. And I was like, I was scared to death that if I drove over there by myself that I was going to leave and just not come back and just go, you know, get some drugs or do whatever. So I should have my dad bring, bring me over there. So my dad brought me off, dropped me off at the front doorstep, knocked on the door. Man opened the door. Huge guy. He played football for the University of Alabama, played for Bear Bryant. And he opened the door and he just gives me a hug. He said, you know, welcome in. You know, I was just like, I'm so sorry for the loss of your son. And so we go over, he invites me to the, they have like a little bar here. And I sit down at the bar with him. And um, he said, all right, what's going on, man? It seems like something's troubling you. And I said, oh, I got something I got to tell you. I'm, I'm struggling. He said, I can tell. I've seen you, you know, he'd been out on some field calls with me. He's like, what's going on? You got problems at home? I was like, yeah, it's a little bit more than that. I'm struggling with, with addiction to, to opiates. And I said, I'm going to go to an inpatient treatment center and get myself some help. And all I did was just give me a hug and say thank you. I said thank you for making this decision to do this. And basically saying he wished that his son had made that same decision. Sure, I bet he did. Yeah. So went to treatment, did the deal, man. Jumped into it head first at that time. I, I'd already been beaten into submission at that point. So you were I was, ready. I was ready. It wasn't like one of these things where I had somebody had to drag me in there or like I had to be beat over the head with it. I was like, I don't know what this thing's going to be. I don't know what these steps have to hold for me. I don't see anything in there about getting my job back, getting my house back, getting my car back, getting all these things, getting some confidence. I was like, but I see people that have worked this program successfully and are doing well in life. And I said, that's what I want. I, I want to just do well. I want to be okay. I want to stop freaking hurting. I want to stop being in so much pain. I don't want to feel like I want to blow my brains out. Every day. Stop, yeah, and stop. I want to stop hate. I want to stop hating myself. Like that was the biggest thing. I just hated myself so much, and I want to stop hating myself. And so I went and did the deal and jumped into it head first. And um, probably 20 days in, I had a really deep, profound spiritual experience. Um, it's funny. It was, it was the irony of it was we were sitting there in the education session, and they had they, they'd have guys come in there and they get up on the board and they talk about working the 12 steps and they really kind of delve into each step and talk about the premise and you'd read out the big book and the 12 and 12 and get into all those things and I remember this one day we were watching a video because the guy that was the educator couldn't be there that day and it was the story of bill wilson and at that time i could give two hoots about bill wilson i, could, I didn't care it was a black and white movie i'm like i don't care about the founders of alcoholics and Anonymous. so we're sitting there and everybody's falling asleep as they're watching the film and I remember sitting there and I'm watching it and all of a sudden I just have this just moment and it's like this light just comes in and I just feel this warmth and I talk about that morphine going to my arm and feeling that warmth go across my chest and feeling like everything's going to be okay. It was like that times like 10,000 and I just felt tears just streaming down my face and just this peace, this just overwhelming peace like everything is going to be okay. And it went on for about almost the entire length of the movie, an hour and a half, two hours after, and I was like, that was God speaking to me. Like, I've never experienced that before in my entire life. Never have I even tried this before. And I was like, this is, this is something I can do, do business with. This is something I can take into those 12 steps and carry it with me. And, um, man, I'd say it was, it was a game changer for me, absolute life changer. Now, it doesn't mean that it, you know, it was a substitute for working the steps, but it was like the first indication that there was a God and that, like, he cared and loved for me and that, he was taking care of me and that he'd been there this whole time, but I just was so doggone stubborn that I wasn't willing to turn it over to him. And he finally, re he had been waiting to reveal himself to me, but I finally opened myself up enough to have him reveal himself to me. And after that, I was like, this is what I want. This is that peace that I'm craving, that I've been craving my entire life, that I've been looking for in drugs and alcohol and success and whatever it was. This is what I've been craving. and I want more of this. So that's, um, that happened. Well, so I got recovered July 19, 2014. That day was August 2nd that that happened. And ever since that day, I mean, I've, been, I've been trying to go all in on the steps and just work this damn thing the best I can, the best of my ability. And that's where I am today. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, that's pretty impressive. So, one and done. Go to treatment one time, it sticks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so... I've heard of people like you. Yeah. <laughs> it was... Um, yeah, for me, uh, you know, I don't know if, I don't know what it was. I can't say that I'm in, you know, it's the thing. It's like I had that deep spiritual experience and. Well, so I sent him a, a I sent him a message on Facebook and I was like, look, send me some bullet points about your life. Cause I really, I don't know. I mean, I 
just met you a little while ago. So did you you ended up getting a divorce and remarrying the same? No, person? no, no. Okay, no, no, no. So so after uh, after went to treatment, um, made a decision while we we're there that it just wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna work. So we, we got divorced, and so I've since remarried. Um, actually, I met the girl that I married. I met her after I came out of treatment. I was went back to pharmaceutical sales and was like all in the pharmaceutical sales. She was working for St. Dominic's um, as a mental health counselor, but what she was doing at the time, she was doing like an in, they had an inpatient treatment center. She was doing some marketing for it. And so she was at one of the clinics that I showed up to, I saw her. I was like, this girl's the most beautiful girl I've seen in my life. There's just something about her. I said, I gotta get her phone number. Try to talk to her at that time of not using drugs or anything like that. I had no game whatsoever. <laughs> so I tried to talk to her, kind of fumble my way through the conversation. And then um, I said, well, I blew that one. And then I went to the next clinic and she was there, lo and behold. And I was like, man, there's something here. So mm -hmm. somehow got her phone number, got her card. And uh, yeah, and so uh, we, we married in 2016. I had my daughter that same year. And so we've been married since. Awesome. Yeah. And how's your daughter? She's six. Yeah. Little girl named Elliot. Her, Elliot, her middle name's Grace, but the, the great Elliot was my my wife's choice. I mean, I was I was at first kind of anti Elliot, but then I, I got on board. But I was I was adamant about Grace because God had shown me so much grace. I was like, I, I have to name her after that. It's awesome. Yeah. It's different having a daughter. Oh, dang. I have one. I get to say to her, "You're my favorite daughter." <laughs> no. Uh, I have three sons, but I get to tell her, you know, mm, let's call her my favorite daughter. That's tough, man. <laughs> it is. Well, it makes you, <clears throat> you certainly think differently about women, mm. you know, when you own one. Mm. <laughs> when you got your own. <laughs> <laughs> That's a correct term. <laughs> I, just got, I just got canceled off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye, guys. All right, ladies, we'll, we'll figure out another way to get y'all back on the show. Again. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Um, so look, walk, tell, walk us through uh, a day in the life. What do you do to maintain your recovery or that connection with the divine? How do you stay driven to achieve what you felt on August 2nd? Yeah, um, it's funny. I was, I was talking to a guy that I'm working with right now about this. and Because and I, I have... I do consider my approach to this very disciplined. Um, I wake up every day at three. Well, I wake up most days. I, I coach boot camps in addition to my day job. So I do fitness boot camps. So I wake up at about 3 a.m. And usually I wake up, take a cold shower, get my day started. But my, the very first thing that I do after that is I hit my, hit my knees. I go into my prayer and meditation time. After I do my prayer and meditation time, then I go into journaling. I do journaling, inventory and journaling. And then after I do my inventory and journaling, then I get into my meditation readings. So I do 24 hours a day book. I do the daily reflections. I do another one, Jesus Calling. I do a few other different reflection or uh, different meditation books, and and that's really how it start my morning. But to me, it's um, I stay I try to stay in conscious contact with God throughout the course of the day. I mean, it's just constant praying, constantly asking for His guidance on things. Um, but obviously, getting getting to meetings, meetings is a huge thing to me. I try to make at least three not four meetings a week if I can, depending on my schedule. Um, and then obviously working with a sponsor and, and calling my sponsor and reaching out to him and um, trying to stay connected there. And I've had to switch sponsors a couple of times in my career just because I, I, we, we lived in uh, Jackson, got a sponsor here, and then, I had to, and then I moved back to Louisiana, got a sponsor when I was in Louisiana. And then when I moved back here to Mississippi a few months ago, I got a new sponsor here in the area. Um, because to me, I tried to do the, the remote sponsor thing and it just didn't work for me. I have to have somebody that's, that's there that I can go and meet with and have conversations with and do those types of things. So I'm, I'm actively calling my sponsor and I, and I actively sponsor other folks as well. And so that to me is like, and then that's, you know, when I work the steps, I try to work the steps and continue to do that. It's not like, just like you said, it's not one, I was one and done. I, it's not one and done as far as the step work goes. I constantly work those steps. And then also when I work with others, it's like I'm reworking the steps myself when I'm working with somebody else. And it's, to me, that's like, it was explained to me that that 12 step, when you work with somebody else, that's really what activates the program. And I, that has been absolutely the truth for me. Like when I work with somebody else, there's some spiritual epiphanies, things that come through when I work with somebody else. That's, whether it was revealed in my, when I was working to the steps, maybe it was, but it's a deeper, more profound understanding. Yeah, layers of understanding yeah. and appreciation of things exactly. that you had missed before. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So, 
to me, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a disciplined approach, but it's, uh, um, you know, I was thinking about it because I, when I was talking to a guy that was working with us, like there's, there's two elements. There's the, the pushing away from, and then there's the running towards. And I, I honestly like, and we always talk about it in, in recovery, you know, like I have to keep at the forefront of my brain who I was during those years of addiction, that animal that I was like that Mr. High, because I wasn't, I mean, I was a wretched human being. I know that I was a wretched human being. Yeah. And I have to remind myself of that. I anchor myself on that. Some people like sit there and yeah, forget the past. No, I can't forget the past. I have to. I have to remember that. And we talk about it, you know, and, and we don't regret the past or wish to shut the door on it because it's one of my greatest gifts now. So I can use that. Exactly. It's funny how you work with somebody, and there's things from your past that you're like, this will never see the light of day. I may have revealed it to my sponsor on my fourth and fifth step. Obviously, I had to do the men's process, but there's certain things where you're like. This will never see the light of day to anybody else. You know, that's, that was just something I had a conversation with my sponsor about. But then all of a sudden you're working with somebody and they reveal something that you said, I would never bring that up. And all of a sudden it's like, it's a gift. It's something I can now pull out, pull that dark thing out of the closet and reveal it to somebody else and be like, look, I've been there. That same exact situation you're talking about right now. Well, this is, this is the same vein that was the motivation for the podcast. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've made so many tremendous life mistakes and poor choices. Mm-hmm. That if I could help one person avoid one of those, it would be worth it. Mm-hmm. You know, and getting people on here to be real honest about the problems they had and the choices they made and how it ruined their lives and everything, mm-hmm. everybody around them. And the more we talk about these things, the less stigma there is attached to it. Yeah. So I salute you for that. I appreciate that. Sure. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a key component of my recovery. I mean, it's, it's the most important thing of my recovery, to be honest with you. Is being able to reveal those things to somebody else if it can help somebody else. So, so does your wife try to ther- therapize you? She doesn't, but she she know I mean she knows me. Like you know, I've got a sponsor that I work with, but she's she's like a built-in sponsor. I mean, she is she's tough. She holds me accountable, but she's tough in a loving way. Um, does she hit you with a? Well, how, how does that make you feel? <laughs> no, she doesn't. She doesn't usually do that to me. She's more along the lines of. Just calls me on my BS, like you know, you're being you're being a shady character right here. You're you know, your dishonesty showing a little bit here, and she'll kind of call me out on those things. And so it's kind of like having a constant mirror at home where she'll just reflect it. But it's not in a way where she's like, where I feel like uh, it's it's finger pointing. It's more just like she just holds me accountable and makes me want to be a better person. So it's it's one of the the best blessings. At first, I can remember there was a pivotal time, or there was a a, a moment in our relationship where I was like. I'm going to go one or two ways because I know that this woman is going to hold me accountable and make me a better person. Either I'm, I'm going to go all in on that or I'm going to cower and go the Rejection. other way, Re- right. cower and go the other way and just keep being an a-hole even though I'm in sobriety. But I feel like if I didn't have her in my life, I probably would have gone that route, which would eventually led me back to drink. I'm not saying that my wife is, that's a very codependent thing to say, but I would say that if, if I had actively made that decision, it would have been an active decision to say, I want to go back to that, that life I was living beforehand. Whereas I know with her, it was a path forward. And I knew she was going to make me better. Support. Yeah, support absolutely. System. 100%. 100%. And as uncomfortable as it is, the best support system is somebody that doesn't co-sign your bullshit. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Because I've been in that relationship before where somebody just either turns the other cheek or doesn't have any interest in what you're doing or they, they want you to... This is the crazy thing, as we're all aware of with addiction, is that it's not just an individual disease, it's a family disease. And there's somebody that's there that's, you know, kind of co-signing on your BS and that's allowing you to be that way. Because if you do get better, that means that they have to take a look at themselves and they may have to get better as well. Right. And I was in a relationship relationship like that where that person didn't necessarily want me to get better because if I got better, that means that they would have to take a look in the mirror themselves as well. And that's when I knew that my first marriage was over. We learn from these things, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, and if my wife Kimberly is listening to this, she's probably got one eyebrow arched <laughs> up. I feel like I'm better at my marriage with her because I can learn from my failures the first time. Mm-hmm. I know she's thinking. <laughs> easy, easy tiger. <laughs> pump, pump the brakes there, big yeah. <laughs> I don't know how good you think you are. <laughs> Where you say, let me call in the show real quick yeah. and let these folks know about really what's going on in Africa. Yeah. Right. Let me tell you all about that timber tantrum. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that little toddler timber tantrum. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday. Oh, it happens. Oh, I get it. It happens. I get yeah, it. yeah, nobody's perfect. Sometimes you have those moments where you're just like, you're in, you're in it, and you're like, I can't stop. 
I know I'm in it. I'm I, invested I'm in this involved. line of argument. Yeah. I'm here. I'm in it. I'm going all in. The ego is at full effect right now, and it's flared up, and I'm not backing off right now. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> all right, let me think of some other things. I do like a lot of your quotes that you sent. Oh, thank you. These are good. I thought about, speaking of Kimberly, I thought about no one cares how much we know until they know how much we care. Yeah. And I thought, you know, because I pride myself on being an unlicensed therapist. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I've been in treatment so yeah. many times that I'm quick to whoop out, well, what you're really doing is blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. And I think... I thought, you know, I wonder if I need to show how much more I care before I whoop out my armchair therapist. Yeah. 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 What are some things you want to talk about if I hadn't asked you that you feel are important? There's, you know, I think that's something that's really important to me and to my recovery um, that we don't talk a lot about um, is the physical fitness component. Not saying that you have to be a... Well, I've joined a gym <laughs> two months ago, so I'm eager to hear this. Look, yeah. I've been killing it. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. I hadn't done squat for like 25 mm-hmm. years except sit at a desk and type. Mm-hmm. So that I go to the gym like four or five mornings a week is nothing but a coup. Yeah. That's, that's all. So you are doing that right now? Good. Yeah. Good for you. I went this morning. Good for you. Good for you. 30 minutes on the Stairmaster. Look, that thing's... Yeah, that's, these, that's serious stuff. It's rough. That'll tax you for sure. But yeah, that, that to me... Let me hear more about this. Yeah, so... Um, you know, physical, I mean, growing up as an athlete, physical fitness was always there. Working out was a big part of it. Training, getting prepared for games and, and sports and seasons and things like that. But I remember when I went to treatment, um, like I'd lost a lot of that. I hadn't worked out in years up to that point. I just remember just being, feeling just terrible. They did all the blood work. They did all the blood pressure. Everything was just awful. And I remember I was like, you know what? This is a time where if I'm going to commit to this, I'm going to do the deal. I'm going to try to get myself back in shape as well. And I, so I started to work out. What, what I started to do is I, they had a, it was a big compound. It was originally supposed to be a golf course, and then they converted it into a treatment center. So they had like a golf, port, golf cart path, and so you could go run that. And so I remember I'd start going out there, and I'd, try, I'd walk at first, and then I'd try to run. I'd run like 100 feet and be like stopped, and then just like hit my knees and just be like, just feeling like I was about to hawk up a lung. But I was like, you know, I'm going to keep pushing this and keep doing this. My back would tighten up. But I was like, I, I'm going to keep pushing this up. I'm going to feel mental, emotional pain. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me being a masochistic human being. I was like, I'm going to feel the physical pain as well as I go through this up. I started to do it. And um, for me, it was, it worked um, in conjunction with my recovery work. Like I found that the more that I went in on that, I would have deeper, more spiritual experiences. The more I was kind of physically taking care of myself. I remember I had some epiphanies when I go on walks and runs and things like that. You know, the sun would be coming up and it would just be like a, a de- it would be a spiritual moment. And I was like, you know what, this is something, there's something to this. And so um, when I got out of treatment, not only did I say I commit to like, I was going to, you know, get back into working out and kind of do those things. And I did it the 30 days I was there and I felt better physically than I felt in years. But I was like, you know what, I want to get back into coaching. Coaching, again, was something that was near and dear to my heart. So that's when I got back into the boot camps and started coaching people. And that's part of that quote where, you know, he says, uh, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I, I realized that with my coaching career as well. Like you can be the most knowledgeable person. You can know the stuff inside and out. You can know all the musculature, how to train people, how to train energy systems. But if people, unless people really know that you care about them and about the fact that you're caring about their physical well-being, their mental and emotional well-being, they don't, they're not going to really, you're not going to build any rapport with that person. And so to me, Coaching was an outlet just like recovery was. And I was like, I kind of tr- treated it the exact same way. But I always felt like when I worked with people, when I sponsored people, it wasn't my job because I'm not a life coach. And I tell people, if your sponsor trying to act like a life coach or act like a therapist, get yourself another life coach or get yourself another um, sponsor because that's not what they're there to do. But I do always um, recommend and suggest to guys that I work with, like, hey, if you know, going for a walk and doing things like that, you know. There is some mind-body connection there. there I heard you is. mention the ice, the cold showers in the morning. Yeah. Are you an ice bath person? I have been. I've done the ice baths in the past. I've done the cold. The buddy the of mine flew to wherever Wim Hof is from yeah, yeah. and interviewed him. Did he really? Yeah. That's got to be a cool experience right there. Yeah, Wim Hof, his story is bizarre. I mean, how he found the cold to be, quote-unquote, his friend. 
he was like in a depression and like suicidal thoughts. And he just this guy swim you know, like he just swim with icebergs and you know, I mean, crazy. Oh, he runs marathons without shoes on, and I mean just sub you know thirty degree negative thirty degree <laughs> temperatures in these high altitudes with no shoes or shirt on, wearing these little short shorts, and he's just figured out a way. I don't know how he's done it, but he's figured out a way. He found out about it when he was like really deeply depressed and. Uh, I think he was like suicidal. He just somehow jumped into a cold water bath and figured out this, there's something to this thing. But yeah, I, I do do that. That's something I do think is a, a huge. Um, it's it, there's so many benefits to the cold. The cold therapy is a huge part, and then I also do the sauna as well. But I haven't done it since I've been back. I kind of haven't found a gym that has that right now. But I would like to get back into doing it. Where do you live? I live out in Brandon, okay. by the by the reservoir. So I joined a gym that's at uh, the corner of uh, Old Fannin and. Uh, the spillway, yeah, yeah. cut and dry. Yeah, I used to work out there. Was Nobody a, has any ice baths. I hadn't seen anybody getting mm-hmm. an ice bath out there, but it used to be. A, um, was it a twenty-four hour? Fitness? There was some kind of twenty-four hour gym. Yeah, the yeah. guys told me the story. Yeah, um, but I found it to be immensely rewarding. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not. I don't like running. Mm-hmm. I mean, nobody's chasing me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, not today, but, at least. If you're running, somebody, you better look. You better be running too, because there's something to chase in well, here. Right? If if we're in danger and there's a bad guy after us, I'm gonna take one for the team. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna last it long. <laughs> Tell us, uh, how, you you mentioned your boot camp. How can we get in touch with you if we're interested in getting getting going with a, one of those boot camps? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Grit Training is the facility where I do it out of. Are they? Are y'all on Facebook? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, they're on Facebook. So it's Grit G R I T Training. Um, it's actually where the old courthouse is off of Lakeland Drive. If you're familiar with the old courthouse, it used to be kind of a mecca for bodybuilders. The facility is, I mean, it's immaculate. Isn't there an indoor pool right there? It is, yeah, yeah. So that's where a lot of like the high school teams swim. They do- um, And they also do scuba diving. Oh, do they? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Yeah, they do a lot of different things there, but um, they have revamped the whole place. You wouldn't even recognize if you've been to the old courthouse before, but it's a beautiful facility. You got an indoor turf and they got all these uh, different sore necks, racks, which are in the, in the sports performance world, pretty big deal. Um, really sore expensive. neck. Sore neck. Oh, sore neck. Sore neck. It may give you a sore neck, but it's called sore <laughs> neck. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. So, but yeah, it's it's pretty unbelievable the stuff they've got in there. And um, but yeah, so if you're if you're interested in the boot camp, is um, we do it Monday through Friday, five a.m. There's also a noon class and then a five forty-five evening class that we do it. And so, um, so just about anybody with any kind of schedule could get involved. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you can come check it out for free. Um, didn't expect to plug it, but yeah, I'll plug it. <laughs> yeah. You can come check it out for free. They get a free week of training. You can check it out anytime. We'd love to have people come. You flip over. over tractor tires, that kind of thing? We don't do tractor tires. Uh, we do have sleds. So we push sleds. We lift, we lift weights. Uh, do squats. I mean, the typical burpees, run stairs. Burpee. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it all. Yeah. So we got we got TRX straps, the bands where you pull yourself up, do push-ups on those things. Um, yeah, you name it, we do it. We do it all. And I'll throw some yoga stuff in there, too. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yoga is a game changer, by the way. If y'all are not yoga fans, if you haven't done yoga, I've tried. I'm a fan. I'm just I'm not good at no. it. Uh, look, this is yoga is one of those things because I'm the same way. It's that mindset of like I'm not good at it. Oh, oh actually, one of my favorite things that people say is I'm not flexible, so I can't do yoga. And I'm like, well, isn't that isn't the that reason, the main isn't main reason, main reason why <laughs> you should be doing yoga? Like, oh, I'm not strong, so I shouldn't come lift weights. Well, isn't that the reason why you should come do it or come try right. it out? But right. Well, I pro- a few months ago, I promised myself, you know, I had this one thing I had to take care of in my life, and I was like, once I get done with that, I'm going to join the gym. Mm-hmm. And I've been as proud of myself as I don't know what. I mean, really. I mean, it's really, I've, I've thought, if I can conquer that, because mm-hmm. getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go to the gym sucks. Yeah, yeah, it's not great. But I stuck with it long enough to where I, viewed, I mean, I was able to recognize some benefit mm-hmm. and thus fuel this yeah. cycle of... Not self defeating behavior, but self supportive. Yeah, right. Self uh, self beneficial behavior. Right. If you if you want to have self esteem, do esteemable things, right? Yeah, it's kind of the same way. Yep. But, but another favorite quote of mine is, is "Embrace the suck." <laughs> That's good. Things are gonna suck. You just gotta embrace it. You know, some things are just gonna be damn hard. But us in the addiction world, we don't. <laughs> I don't want things to be hard. I want things to be. I want, things, well. I want. I, I want things to be easy, and I want yeah. to find that easier, softer way. But sometimes the hard way is the easier, softer way, because going the other way just leads to a whole lot more pain and others, others desperation. Yep. So I try to stay away from that. Well, man, I'm tapped out. Yeah. Well, it's pretty great. 
I've enjoyed it. Yeah. I, enjoyed I it. can't thank you enough, really. Yeah. I appreciate y'all having me. I've thoroughly enjoyed this, and I'm excited about it. If there's anything I can do to help this thing kind of take off even more so, let me know. Well, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Believe me, I, I remember when people offer to do things. Yeah, no, 100%. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it's kind yeah. of, we'll plug grit performance. Grit, what is it? Grit training. Grit, grit training. training, yeah. Yeah, I've seen it all over Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go check it out, y'all. Grit training. Yeah, grit training. Neil, Great. thank you. Thank you. I appreciate right. y'all having Recovery me. Recovery Lab is better for having had you. Absolutely. Mm. Well, I feel better for having been in Recovery Lab. Thanks, Thanks man. Thanks, appreciate brother. y'all. Appreciate you. Y'all are awesome.